Elusive one here. We are at the trailhead on to get to the film site location. Uh, joining us out of this, oh, you already know I already made a video about that, but we are here. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're about to get our about to get our hike on. What? So this is the walk to the film site location. It's not bad at all. Chilly. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm so like, I, I don't, how do I explain this? Words can't hurt. It's they're just. I got nothing. <laughs> I can't explain this. Can't wait. Explain the way I'm, I'm excited. This is like where I'm going to the place from. As a little kid, I used to see pictures of and seeing Patty in black and white in this location scared the crap out of me and I'm heading back there right now 50 years to the date today is Friday October 20th 2017 50 years ago today is when Roger and Bob rolled out here this is just this is awesome this is me facing my fears, wanting to be in the same spot where, I guess you say, what really kind of kicked it off started. Um, you know, of course, it was gorillas, but then growing up and looking at the Patterson game in the film, Patty herself, it was like, whoa, I was terrified, I was scared, scared the bejesus out of me. I mean, this is beautiful, beautiful stuff. Praise the Lord that I'm here. And it's by His graces that I am. Daniel. Hi, Abe. Yes. I Must be Ian. Tremendous that yep. you could make it. <laughs> Happy 50th. It you too. Happy you too. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ian. You knew I would be here. The That's force amazing. is with me. <laughs> yeah, this is great. This is great. Oh, so. There's eight other people coming behind you? Yeah, there are. Right on. Yeah. So you came from Minnesota? We flew from Minnesota. You know, Mike Foss, did you meet him? I met him, yes. First time? Today. Today. Yeah. He came out too. Yeah. He, he was down here yesterday and we were doing some other filming here. That's so uh, cool. But this is absolutely positively the site. There's That's no awesome. question about it. But it, it's changed. <laughs> God, I'm so, so glad you made it. Wow. Minnesota. Right. Represent. So, right. now, <laughs> Kevin, is this Ian everyone? Yeah. Yes. Oh, nice well, we may as well have a crash course. Let's do it. Uh, uh, and I'll do the, the introductions here. <laughs> Who's been to the film site here before? Never. Grace, Ian has, Ian's been here many I have, times. not to the exact one, but very close. Okay, so you've been Twice, close. Twice, yeah. Okay, this is absolutely, positively the film site. As, as you know, there cannot be an alternative, alternative fact where there's two film sites. There's only one. So we're going to go for a little walk. This is my dog, by the way, Pre, so you could say hi to him and feed him. <laughs> <laughs> In general, the general filming started from this location here. 
Now understand, understand uh, at the time, 50 years ago, there was more bank here. This, this real estate went out a little further. Mm -hmm. So Roger started filming over here. Now what you have to understand as well, see the creek? The creek is about, what, maybe 20 feet below? At the time when this film was shot, that creek was about three feet below this bank. Because sure. this, what we're on right now, is the original bank, the original yeah. film Sand, site. Sandbar. So what, what's happened over the years, all of that area has been eroded. So as it, as, as it erodes, the okay. creek bed just keeps going down mm -hmm. and down and mm -hmm. down. So that's why the creek is so low. But at the time, the creek was much higher up. And so they're coming around from over here in that general vicinity, Roger and Bob, the subject is probably in this general area and it reacts possibly to maybe hoof prints or whatever but uh, according to uh, an interview with Bob Gimlin that John Green did he said what was the subject first seen when you saw it he said it was getting up so that would assume that it was it was right there at the creek got up and just started walking away so as we walk forward here We'll go look, uh, two things that I, I want, there's a, there's a stump called a smiley face and then there's a big stump. Those stumps can be seen in the original movie. There's also a very prominent big tree. We're gonna go see that. That locks this place in. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's go. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, thanks a lot. We're walking, we're walking this way. <laughs> Walk this way. Walk like Talk a man. that way. Talk like a man. Now, can I stop you? Yes. Yesterday, I made a joke to the people that were here yesterday. Uh, I said that you're not going to believe that the film site has changed over those 50 years. Now they have a McDonald's here. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a joke. <laughs> I'll wait till everyone gets here. But uh, in fact, stay there while I point it out. Uh oh, what do we got? Stump. This is one of the big stumps that's seen in the film. The subject is over there, walking in that direction. And then if we go over here, here's another stump. They call this stump smiley face because I think at the time it had a smiley face on it. And so this is the other stump. So you could see from here to here, as the subject walks, walks by, hmm. the stumps are seen. Now what I want to show you, when you look at the film and you look at the famous 352 frame, which is actually not 352, it's probably more like 354 based on Bill Munz's analysis of the film, where he came up with not 952 frames, but 954 frames. So, a, so that the film count is a little bit different than what popular belief is. So, but in that frame is frame that we'll call for the sake of argument, frame 352, there is a big tree, a big tree, a Douglas fir that's prominently seen. We're gonna go look at that right now. And in fact, let's go this way. Be careful walking. The big tree is oh, right there. Yeah. That is the big tree. And the Q-stick tree, which is right there, oh, sure. locks everything in. You've got all the things that you need to make it what it is, which is the Patterson and Whoop! Whoop! Good job. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the big tree right there that you could see very prominently yes. in the film.
And one thing you have to understand, in 50 years, a lot of trees have grown up here. Oh, yeah. So you don't have the same viewpoints as you do back at the time. It was all cleared out quite a bit, quite a bit open. Now you have a lot of trees that have grown and fell down, and the view is not as good as yeah, before. Okay. So, <laughs> does everyone see? Yeah. This is awesome. The big tree. The big tree. MNBRT in the big tree. <laughs> Very cool. There's another tree off to the right here we call the ladder tree and when Bill Munns was doing a lot of his studies for sake of familiarity with a certain tree we called it certain names and one has a bunch of branches sticking out that are busted and it looks like a ladder so we've called that the ladder tree and then further to the right there's two trees uh, that we call Laurel and Hardy. There's one that's big and fat and one that's skinny. So they call those Laurel and Hardy. There's another tree that was seen in the original film site that was uh, leaning to the right like this. It's quite tall, but it looked, it was naked of any branches of any leaves. Hence the name Q-Stick. Looked like a Q-Stick. It's still here 50 years later. See that thing right there? Yeah. That's it. Wow. That can be seen in the film as well. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Yeah. That's the remains of the Q stick tree right there. Wow. Q stick tree? And so this what what makes this really interesting is that fifty years later, all of these landmarks that are attached to the ground are still there. The trees, the stumps. And when I was at a conference in September in Washington State, Mark Marcel, if I'm saying his name correctly, <laughs> said he was able to find the Ape Canyon uh, cabin that uh, Fred Beck and his minor companions used by going back to newspaper clippings, archival information in the newspapers, and looking at where the cabin was, a picture of the cabin with stumps. And he said, if I could find those stumps, I can find where the cabin was. He found those stumps and the remains of the cabin with uh, old nails that were there still. And so that's the same technique, if you will, that he used probably without knowing that that technique was used when Steven Struford and Robert Leiterman rediscovered the film site 2011-2012 because it basically got buried. And one other point is that in 2003, when a bunch of us was, were here, John Green was still living, for the International Sasquatch Symposium, Todd Neese was here, by the way, uh, is that uh, we weren't exactly certain where the film site was, but a group of us, including Dr. Jeff Meldrum, John Green, Matt Moneymaker, Doug Hycheck, Autumn Williams, and myself, we came up the back side of the film site over there and we came up the bank and we were in all these trees here so in 2003 we were on the film site without knowing right. it right wow and it, it it didn't dawn on me till a few years ago i said holy cow <laughs> we were here and we didn't even know it we were looking around and i'm saying 
I'm saying this is it because this is that's where we came up and we were navigating our way back that way from over there from in in the creek another thing that you'll know about this area is that this film site when you get around the corner here the creek turns and goes this way and when you look at the creek to know that you're there that creek straightens out it's called like bowling alley straight and War the late Warren Thompson a Bigfoot researcher was the person who kind of coined that term the bowling alley straight the creek gets super straight and you could see it over there past the film site so if you know you can find the bowling alley straight you pull back into this area this is it so that's the nickel tour. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> he no, wants a picture she... with you, Daniel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Where did you walk off to and go up the hill? Okay. So basically, just in general, you see where they are over there? Uh huh. The subject is, we'll call her, she's walking and she makes a little bit of an arc and she starts walking this way, uh, this way, like mm -hmm. back and forth, uh, somewhat parallel to the creek off in that direction. She crosses the creek uh, onto the Bluff Creek Road, which mm -hmm. was gravel, and she goes up a hillside. Oh. And according to Richard Henry, she put a foot on the hillside. And as Richard Henry said, it was an extremely steep piece of property going up. And the subject may have made a decision. This was not a quick exit route and instead went up the gravel road that way and so Bob Titmus was here later the late Bob Titmus the investigator at the latter part of October and he stated that there was very clear evidence where Patty as she's now affectionately known was sat on some ferns and had a clear vantage point of Roger and Bob doing their thing down here making plaster castings mm -hmm. right. and so what she basically did after the fright went away Came back and and it, with a wild animal, fright tends to go away once you get distance between mm -hmm. you and whoever's pursuing you. She doubled back and probably up on this mountainside, you can't see how steep it goes up, maybe over there where you could see the trees that are high. Right, right. And she's looking down with a clear cover of canopy down to the film site as to what Roger and Bob are doing back over here. Which And they were making casts. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So that, any more questions? So, um, Bob and them approached from that direction? Yes, and Bob, Bob, Bob and Roger were coming upstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I can't say it's a, a, a for certain fact, but you would tend to get the impression that if the, the water is moving downstream, they're coming upstream, the air might be moving downstream as well, the direction. So if the horses smelled, uh, that, their, cover that scent. their scent would have been covered. So it was just one of those chance opportunities where the subject was taken completely off guard, and especially by the fact if she was down drinking water at the creek, maybe her senses were, her, her ears were hearing the muffle of the water ripples. Mm. So she was blinded in a sense from hearing and maybe her view too. Yeah. And she didn't get wind of things till she got up and said like, oh, there's two, there's three horses, two people, I need to get going, which she did. She walked away. So then with that being said, there was no way of her basically saying, okay, I got to protect a young one and got out of there trying to lure them away from that area. That's all, that's all what you would call speculation yeah. because no one even to this day knows that she had any young ones. Right. It, I mean, most people would argue that she was probably female based on the breast. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, that's, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the idea that she had a young one, that says like, well, maybe she had one, two, three. I mean, then you're Who really right. going off the deep end. Yeah. I think they would have found footprints of the babies. Well, but yeah. They, if they were, fact, if they were there. In fact, Eric Bechard was one of the first, the late Eric Bechard was one of the first persons that said, uh, that you could see one of the babies on yeah. Patty as she walked away and not just simply no. There's no support for that idea. Yeah. It was just Eric Beckford with his 
oftentimes the researcher were, were making these ideas uh, to get attention for themselves, not attention for the subject matter. It was just, uh, like you said, it was a combination of all things, the noise from the water. Wasn't it behind an uprooted tree yes. or something? So it was sight, sound, it was just caught off guard. It's good that you should bring that up because mm -hmm. Bob Gimlin stated that there was a uprooted tree with the roots sticking up and he said that it was like as big as a house and there actually is 50 years later there's an uprooted tree root system there with a stump flipped up where you could see the the roots and i'm wondering if that might be the same one just maybe pushed by the elements over mm -hmm. 50 years mm -hmm. and it's still out yeah. there if anything it might be downstream a little bit of you know, yeah where you said it was. and like the, the conditions you see today are probably very much like the same conditions weather conditions Roger and Bob said it was a it was a cool day but it was sunny and so they had at the time good good blue skies and the rains didn't the rains didn't come in till after midnight on the 21st hmm well, in a sense this is the same day yeah October 20th sure. this is yeah 50 well years right later. yeah exactly 50 exactly. years later exactly. and so if people if people say the argument is like well, why haven't we got one now? My comeback would be is that the, the population of the species would be very low in general. Like if you look at the wolverine, the state biologists say, and in, this was in the newsletter, the Bigfoot Times, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, they recorded by camera, trip camera, I guess, one wolverine in the state of California. So we know we have one wolverine <laughs> in the state of California. So here's, here's the, the comment. Okay, if there's only one in the state of California, how often do you think people will see it? Not very no. often. Exactly. So, say for the sake of argument, there might be six Bigfoot in just Northern California spread out. How often do you think you'll see them? No, hardly ever. Very, yeah. very infrequently. Exactly. So it almost seems like you're dealing with uh, a ghost or an apparition or mm. something of that nature rather than reality. But the reality of the matter the less the population, the less that you're going to see them. Oh, totally. Well, what yeah. about the gene pool as far as, I mean, there would have to be, I mean, we all know there's bear, you know, and, and things like that in the wild too. And, and maybe one will get spotted every so many years or whatever of a certain type. But we, we know that there's thousands of them out there. So wouldn't we, could, could we also use that same thought process to, for the squash? I mean, honestly, we know they're there. I mean, I've had personal experience, uh, you know, nothing super hard concrete or anything, but just personal. But we know that they're there. We know that there are a lot of them there, but they're just elusive as hell. That, that's true. I mean, you think, you think about their basic framework. They're built similar to us, uh, hair covered. And you think about, we think of ourselves as the most intelligent animal life form on the planet, which is probably so. I mean, you could see what we've, how we've altered the planet. So you look at a species like this, and it's it, just by maybe guessing, you would say like, there's probably endowed by an extreme high cranial capacity to think and to reason and to, to make deductions. And that might be what's going on there. It's just like, there might be a tremendous thought process there that we are not aware of. Because like I tell any, everyone who's willing to listen, we are studying Sasquatch reports, not Sasquatches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a True. very crucial differentiation uh, difference. But by the so. reports, we also can get an idea of where they roam and, and geography, uh, top, you know, geographical areas, what's in there as far as plant life, wildlife, and stuff like that, which we could speculate on a good habitat for them. It's all and, speculation. And this, it is. This here, you look at this area, this is, this is like tremendous country for Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And another thing I wanted to point out, too, is that when people talk about the Patterson-Gimlin film, is they think of it as a singular, one-time deal. And so when they start talking about it, they're, they're almost, they're missing, the, they're, they're not telling you the full story. They don't realize that in August and September, Rene DeHinden and John Green were here investigating other reports of tracks. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there was a, a preload to the whole thing working up. It wasn't some single isolated mm -hmm. incident. It's just like Patty may have been part of another group 
that green into Hinden saw early August and September. Sure. And she just happened to be by herself at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the way. And and the Blue Creek Mountain Road, uh, Onion Mountain, and all of, all of those mountains are part of a chain up here. They're they're all connected. It's not like the Blue Creek Mountain is 10 million miles away. Mm. It's six miles away from here. It's not that far. And okay. so this is all part of a ridge system. And it's just like, if you're a wild animal, this this is your highway mm. to get around. Mm -hmm. wow. And so the idea of padding be, being here, it's not that foreign to me or when you start to think about the matter with some intelligence. Mm -hmm. wow. Awesome. Thank you again, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, thank nice you. Well, appreciate wow. it. There's, I didn't even know I was giving a tour. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. But what I wanted to do for myself, because I've been involved uh, since, I'm 54, I've been involved since 1973 when I saw The, Le the Legend of Boggy Creek. Mm. So I was 10 at the time. And so I said, if there's any place on the planet I want to be on the 50th anniversary of the film, it's right here. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know. That was awesome. Freaking awesome. To be where Patty was. That was... <laughs> to be... And what could be... Her place. Her descendants home still. <laughs> it was just fun. It was a really cool experience. On the 50 year anniversary. All right, on to the dinner at the VFW in Willow Creek. <laughs>